All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining me for the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Today, Dr. Hall will be um, discussing important differences in the clinical care of African Americans. Gregory L. Hall, MD, is an associate pr professor in both the Internal Medicine and Integrative Medical Sciences departments at the Northeast Ohio Medical University, as well as an assistant clinical professor at Case Western Reserve University. Dr. Hall was a governor-appointed member of the Ohio Commission on Minority Health and served as the chairman for many years. Currently serves as the board president of the Cuyahoga County Board of Health. Dr. Hall's book, Patient-Centered Clinical Care for African Americans, is the first comprehensive title detailing the optimal clinical care of African Americans. Most recently, Dr. Hall was named the Edgar B. Jackson, Jr., MD Endowed Chair of Diversity and Clinical Excellence and serves as the Medical Director of University Hospital's Cutler Center for Men. Thank you, Dr. Hall, for joining us today. Well, thank you for um, having me. We'll get this going. All right, so um, we're going to start with um, it's over there. One of the learning objectives, we're going to look at the basic mortality uh, demographics for the U.S. by race and ethnicity. Uh, for the top causes of death, we're going to look at health disparities in the U.S. for diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, other major cancers. And we're going to look at some research-confirmed differences in the clinical care of African Americans that can make a difference in your, in your practice. So I'm going to start with an overview of U.S. demographics, which are really quite similar to Ohio demographics. And, and uh, 61 percent uh, white Americans, 13 percent African Americans. Um, you know, you see 19 percent Hispanic Latinos, 6 percent Asian Pacific Islanders, those are the U.S., but in, in, in Ohio, 61 and 13 is pretty much the, uh, the case. Um, I show this map because it sort of struck me looking at where African Americans live in the United States. And so the darker, the, the green, uh, the greater, darkest one is greater than 40 percent of African Americans in the area. And then as the green gets lighter, it's, it gets less. And so you can see along the eastern seaboard and then in the southern states and then in those select large cities. So uh, you can see where African Americans tend to live uh, in, in the United States. And so they're in those, those southern states along the eastern seaboard. But then, uh, and, you know, if you look to the Midwest, the true Midwest, uh, and um, I always say we're the Mideast, but you look in the true Midwest and then toward the West, is this, is a, there's a significant uh, drop in African Americans. So if you look in Cleveland, for example, uh, it's surprising to me as someone who grew up in Cleveland, I'm, uh, Cleveland is uh, over 50% African American, uh, 30, 34% white. But then look at Dayton, almost 40% African-American, Cincinnati, over 40, 43% African-American, Youngstown, which is surprising to me, 43% African-American, just more African-Americans in Youngstown than whites. Um, and so if you look at the state of Ohio, and this is a, a census uh, track, it just sort of shows where African-Americans live. They tend to live in the major cities. You see Columbus, Toledo. Cincinnati, Cleveland, all those areas. And then the areas outside of those urban areas, there's dramatically less. And so what happens is because there's an increase of chronic diseases, hypertension, diabetes, things that we'll talk about, if you go out into the waiting room in an urban hospital you know, in the state of Ohio, you're gonna see 40 to 50% of the patients are African-Americans. So it's significantly higher because you're in a hospital in an urban area and because African-Americans tend to live in the urban areas. You go to a major hospital in a rural area, you're going to see very, very few African-Americans. And so that kind of skews your, your perception. If you think uh, you're in Cleveland and say, you know, 13% of the U.S. population is African-Americans, that's not, you're not going to see 13% of your practice be African-Americans, and you're going to see, based on your, um, your specialty, you're going to see significantly high. If you're a nephrologist, you're going to see high. If you're a cardiologist, you're going to see significantly high. And that disparity, that 13% in Ohio, is still compared to Ohio Medicaid spending, which is almost at 30% for African-Americans. So we have a significant disparity between how much we spend the Medicaid on a population that's only 13%, but we're spending a third, almost a third of our, our Medicaid dollars on that. So I always say, um, so this is the, the reason why you're in Cleveland or in Youngstown or Cincinnati and you're learning about African-American health is the reason that if I moved to Amish country, I would learn about Amish, Amish health. And, there, and there's published uh, articles 
um, you know, addressing issues in, in Amish health. And so I kind of, when I got kind of went down a rabbit hole, I started to increase beef, increase potatoes, increase heart disease. And so kind of when I saw Amish families at the hospital, they were usually there for open heart surgery or things of that, things of that nature. And so those are things that, that because if, if you were to open a practice in Amish country, you'd learn about, but you're in, you're not in African American country, but you're in a country where there's a, a, a region of the area where there's significantly higher. And that's what makes some of these things we'll discuss today more important. So let's look at some clinical outcomes and disparities as, as they exist. And I want to start with just the, the national latest national uh, vital statistics, um, uh, average mortality at birth um, that was just released in March of this year with our most recent data from 2019. And so um, I've been doing this until, and people are getting better about knowing what the true answers are, but I just want you to look at this in a second and decide, you know, who, who this is men and women combined, have a uh, life expectancy of 74.8, who has 78.8, who has 81.9, and who has 85.6. So that's between um, African-Americans, uh, white Americans, um, Hispanic Latino Americans and uh, Asian American, Asian Pacific Islander Americans. So who's the 74, the 78, the 81 and 85, just sort of think that to yourself. Um, and because I'm speaking, I always spot everybody, the 74.8 is African American. So actually think about what those other three and, and where, where you would put uh, whites, Hispanic Latinos and, 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 um, and Asian Pacific Islanders. And then if you're smart, you're not surprised, but I was always surprised to learn that white Americans had 78.8, uh, Hispanic Latinos lived longer than white Americans at 81.9, almost 82, and that Asian Americans are the longest livers in, in the United States at 85.6. And so let's break that down. This is kind of combined men and women, but let's break it down. So an a non-Hispanic Asian American female, the average lifespan, average lifespan, 2019 is 87.4. It's really amazing to me. Uh, Hispanic female right behind there at 84.4. And then an Asian male is next at 83.5. A white female, 81.3. An Hispanic male, 79.1. Black female at 78.1. So again, I was raised to, to believe that, that women live longer than men, but uh, black females don't live as long as Hispanic Latino males or Asian Pacific Islander males. Uh, right behind them are white males at 76, uh, then Native uh, American women and um, Alaskan Natives at um, 75, uh, African American male like myself at 71, and then a Native American Alaskan Natives have the lowest life expectancy at 68.6. And so you see that huge gap between the 68.6 and the 87, that's you know, that, that's what we, we as, as providers need to try to figure out, what can we do to narrow that? So even knowing what an average makes, and we all know what average and mode and mean and whatnot, but, but it sort of was striking to me that if you look at, this is where, how, how long a set amount of people, the percentage of people that are alive by what year. And so if you look um, at, at, at age 80, over 80% of Asian American females are still alive at age 80, over 80%, which is sort of striking to me, compared to uh, at age 80, about 56, 57% of, of African American females are alive. If you look at age 80, about 70 some percent of Asian American males, 70% of Asian American males are alive at age 80. There's a lot, we see a lot of sick people, but, but a lot of people are alive out there, right? And then uh, just under 40% of African-American males are alive at age 80. And, and none of those 40% were in the Hall family. I have yet to have someone in my, uh, an African-American male in my family live to, live to 80. So it's a significant and it's close to home, right? And so African-Americans have the worst outcomes as it relates to cardiovascular disease. And again, look, if you look at the numbers, it's, it's not just 
edging out the close, the worst. It's by far the worst, 321 per 100,000 compared to 245 and, and so on. And you see that, and then what's funny is, when, ironic, not funny, that you see this, this the same breakdown you would see as it relates to life expectancy. And this is why, you know, who has the lowest cardiovascular disease, Asian Pacific Islands, 137. So look at that, 137 compared to 321. So that's the difference. And, and the same thing with Hispanic Latinos, still less than white Americans at 188. We look at diabetes, um, African Americans edging out uh, Native Americans, um, but significantly higher. Look at that 17 compared to um, Asian Pacific Islanders. So, you know, worst death outcomes related to that. And then in terms of cancer, the absolute worst outcomes African Americans have for breast, ovarian, cervical, colon, prostate, pancreatic, liver, thyroid, and head and neck. So the absolute worst. And so what's not there? Uh, what's obvious and not there? I'll give you a second to pause. What's not there? Well, it's lung cancer. And this latest information in 2019, uh, white Americans just edged out African Americans for having the worst outcomes related to lung cancer. And when I started lecturing about this over 50, 20 years ago, I always, African Americans had the worst outcomes for lung cancer, but this new, um, new development, or latest information is showing that whites just edging them out uh, in terms of lung cancer mortality. And again, you see that low lung cancer mortality for Hispanic Latinos and the low as well for Asian Pacific Islanders, but Native Americans and um, um, Alaskan Natives, much higher rate of, of lung cancer and that's increased burden uh, from, from smoking. So if you look at colon cancer, um, African Americans by far have the highest um, mortality, uh, latest information, uh, and then followed closely by whites and then, and then um, Native Americans, back, uh, Alaskan Natives, right in there. And then the lowest, of course, Asian Pacific Islanders and in between is Spanish Latino. So then colon cancer, that burden is significant. And colon cancer is, is um, you, as you may know, that, that the African-Americans have been suggested to have their colonoscopy start at 45 for almost 20 years. But when I, I speak at Grand Rounds, I say, you know, what year did we start screening for colon cancer? And everyone would yell 50. But, but in reality, it's been 45 for African Americans for 20 years. Now they just lowered the recommended date to 45 for majority populations. And I think that that's gonna help capture a lot more people. In terms of breast cancer, again, African Americans have the worst uh, rate of breast cancer. And this is the, the ultimate health disparity question. The health disparity, uh, what do you point to when someone says, you know, tell me about health disparities. Well, white American women have a higher rate of breast cancer compared to African Americans. So the rate, if we looked, if I showed you a slide, which I have, showed a rate, the rate of breast cancer rate, you would see a higher one for white Americans and then African Americans would be in second place. But then African Americans far away have the highest mortality for breast cancer. And so why should a group who doesn't get the highest rate of a cancer have the highest mortality? That's kind of what our job is as providers to try to figure out and try to erase that, that difference that really doesn't, doesn't make sense. So if you look at all the cancers together, you can see why every visit, if, if I have a patient that's smoking, I'm spending time talking to them about stopping smoking because lung cancer by far is our biggest uh, cancer burden. And you can see the, the orange is male and the blue is female. And so more males with lung cancer than female, but just see how that compares up to colon cancer and pancreatic and breast. So the, the, every time, and, I, and I'm, if you're deliberate about talking to your patients about stopping smoking, and you, you know, I don't know that I've ever talked someone into stopping smoking in one visit. It's, it takes multiple visits. You have to kind of come at it from different angles. And, and scare tactics is not, not the best approach, but, um, but I, if you talk, if you, we know all the impact of, of smoking, increased diabetes, which people kind of look at you crazy, but smoking increases your rate for diabetes. And so being able to, to just educate your provider, your patients about, um, you know, stopping smoking will absolutely help with lung and bronchus, but people sort of think that's a long shot them getting it. But if you, they're overweight, they worry about, they have people in their family with diabetes, circulation problems, peripheral artery disease. We'll talk about all those things, but it's worth talking about smoking cessation at every single visit for someone who smokes, every single visit. Um, but then you see also see colon cancer, men and women pretty balanced, pancreatic, same thing, pretty balanced, um, breast, prostate, and then liver. So 
Let's look a little bit closely at cardiovascular diseases. Um, this was a study uh, in circulation, big paper, uh, 2017, just looking specifically at cardiovascular disease in African-Americans. And they summarized by saying, you know, just across all the metrics, African-Americans had the poorest outcomes for cardiovascular disease. Um, and it's just a higher mortality just across the board. Um, and that, that, you know, although as Americans, we've made great strides in improving the health uh, in terms of cardiovascular disease, that African-Americans have sort of lagged behind for a, num for a number of reasons. Um, right now, one and a half increased risk for hypertension in African-Americans, almost twofold increased risk for heart disease, twofold increase for heart failure, and three to fourfold increased risk of stroke. Okay, and, and then African-Americans are twice as likely to experience sudden cardiac death. I mean, that which is significant. And so it's, you know, it's easy to say twice as likely, three times as like, you know, three times, but that's a lot. We're not talking 57% compared to 61%. We're talking about twice. We're talking about three times, four times, dramatically increased risks of this and that. And so even though it's sort of easy to say, it's almost like we almost need to put the numbers up to, you know, twice as likely to have a sudden cardiac death is a big deal. And, and, it, and an African-American at age 45 has five times as likely to experience an intracerebral hemorrhage, five times as like at, at age 45, which is young, right? And so hypertension is present in 90% of those hemorrhagic strokes. And then we, I see, and I know you guys see hypertension, blood pressure is just like what's on this monitor, 155 over 194. And we, we almost get numb um, um, seeing these numbers, um, you know, just one after the other out there. But that's the cause. That's what we're trying. We've got to do something about these blood pressures so we can do something about these strokes. Um, diabetes and smoking are big contributors to these hemorrhagic smoke strokes. And, and it's hard to know, you know, when something like this happens, it's hard to know it's coming. It's hard to know it's an issue. Um, I had a, a patient who, um, a nice lady actually came in when I first started and she was 63 and she asked me to take care of her because uh, she didn't have insurance, but she was going to be 65 in a couple of years. And so this was an old story. So I took care of her. I said, sure, that's no problem. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll work it out some kind of way. And then because of that, she sent me her two sons and both of her sons worked, worked at RTA, which was, which was which good insurance if you're, if you're out here. And then their sons sent their wives and a son. And so it all because I took the lady, I took care of a lady who was 63 and a half until she was 65. I got like six people with normal, with good insurance, right? And then she turned 65 and she's still alive, uh, still alive today. But unfortunately, one of her sons dropped dead at like 48 years old. Um, they, I was called by the police. Uh, they were at his house. He was, he was just dead on arrival. Uh, when they went over there and um and they were like will you sign the death certificate and i was like i don't i don't really know what what had happened and this lady's husband had died in his uh, early 50s which i so i had that history the guy was a little obese he had a little bit of hypertension but he was really good about checking his blood pressure he was really just a prince of a guy and um and so i didn't know what he died from it was a complete left field and I and kept sort of stood my ground, I, even though the the the, um, the the people at the coroner's office really wanted me to just say he had a heart attack, and they ended up doing an autopsy on him, and he'd had a, a hemorrhagic stroke and a major hemorrhagic stroke, and that was what it was. And I never would have put that down as a cause of death, because I really didn't know what it was. But that's that's what it was. He he had smoked, but he stopped. He was big, but he was trying to lose weight. But that was what caused him, and I never would have known that. And then I didn't know about this this data about about hemorrhagic strokes and with African Americans in their in their in their forties, so uh, across the age range in terms of peripheral vascular disease, African Americans have twice as high a rate of peripheral vascular disease, and that smoking again is 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 much worse. The smoking exposure in African Americans causes way more damage as it relates to peripheral um, peripheral vascular disease than I think we 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 know. Right, and so they, we certainly have um, smoking uh, linked to peripheral vascular disease, but it's it's so linked that you can measure it according to the number of cigarettes. And so we, you know, I I normally sort of don't accept 
slowing down smoking. I'm smoking less. I'm smoking five a day. I, you know, I just kind of roll my eyes because I, I need you to stop completely. But in people with peripheral vascular disease, if they go from 20 to 10, they've, they've had their risk. They've done a great thing. If they go from 10 to five, as much as I hate to say, you know, kind of good job, if they're actually doing that, it's been shown, at least in the Jackson Heart Study, that that's directly related to the number of, of cigarettes. I, I find that peripheral vascular, people with peripheral vascular disease, they find it very hard to stop smoking completely, more so than almost any other group. And it, when you know it's directly related to smoking, but, um, but, but just know that you can kind of accept whatever kind of win you can get as it relates to uh, smoking with people with peripheral vascular disease. Um, and then again, as I mentioned earlier, smoking, the, the current smokers and African-Americans, um, significantly higher likelihood of, of getting that disease and also a high likelihood of increased aortic uh, calcium burden. And so an yet another uh, reason to stop smoking. And, and again, diabetes and hypertension uh, uh, and smoking are biggest um, risk. And unfortunately, um, when the times for uh, time comes for an amputation, African Americans are 70, 70, 77 higher risk for having to undergo uh, an amputation for for peripheral vascular disease. So hypertension is really if it's like you know if someone said, well, what did they talk about? So what was Grand Rounds about today? Is about doing better about controlling hypertension. And that's, that's in maybe talking the patient into doing better with taking their medicine and prescribing better medications and all that. So I'm not putting it all on us. Lord knows the patients have, have a big part of, of their health, but knowing that, it, that if we can control hypertension, we can kind of prevent a lot of these areas. And it's our biggest area of opportunity. It's where it's the low lying fruit as it relates to uh, us as providers. And uh, this sort of struck me that if you look, look at the systolic blood pressure, it's more than um, three times uh, greater the impact of lowering the systolic blood pressure. So a 10 millimeter of mercury um, um, increase in systolic blood pressure in a white person will result in an 8% increased risk in stroke compared to three times that, a 24% uh, increase in stroke in, in African-Americans with just 10 millimeters of mercury systolic blood pressure. So it's like, you know, we, we kind of want to leave someone alone with a 151 over 88, but this data would suggest that, that you shouldn't do that. And um, this study struck me because I have a lot of patients ask me, you know, why do I have hypertension? I don't believe you, why do I have it? So this looked at the incidence of hypertension and just shows again, like I mentioned earlier, a one and a half, two times risk in African Americans of just having um, hypertension, regardless of your baseline blood pressure, regardless of your blood pressure in your 20s or 30s, is still much higher. And this shows that by age 55, three quarters, 75% of, of black men and women have hypertension compared to 55% of white males at age 55 and 40% of white females at age 55. So three out of four, so you one out of four black person age 55 and older doesn't have hypertension. And so those are the people that, that everyone else is kind of pointing to. I, I don't have hypertension, well, you don't have it, haven't had it diagnosed, but it's not a surprise. And I say three out of four African-Americans at 55 have hypertension. I tell people I have hypertension, which I do. So I'm one of those three out of four. And so we just have to, we have to accept that and try to move on rather than questioning the diagnosis, which many people do. Now this graph from that study shows with, with um, um, black males is the solid, I guess, tan or a brown uh, line, a white, uh, sorry, uh, black females is the dotted uh, brown line. And then the solid black line is, is white men and the dotted Line is uh, white women. If you look at age uh, 33, a third of African American men have hypertension, and that's compared to um, you know a third of white men at age 43. So there's a nine year nine year difference, 42 nine year difference between when you know a percentage has has. Um, has hypertension. If you look at women, uh, African American women, it, it's just about 38. By age 39, a third of African American women. By age 39, which is young, compared to you know almost 50, 52, 53 
uh, years old for white women. And that, they really don't ever really go much higher than 40% if you follow that, looking at that. So that's a significant number of people at much younger age having hypertension that, that really we're not, we're not capturing. And so there, you, I'll see someone who was playing basketball, their knee hurts and they come in, they're 32 years old and their blood pressure is 170 over 105. And they say, well, I'm in pain or I had to wait or I didn't know where you're going to be or, you know, all the excuses. But, but in my mind, I'm not, I'm now trying to figure out how I can recheck that person, how I can convince them to check their blood pressure at home so we can diagnose them. Because when they, when they have a, uh, um, an aneurysm rupture at 47, it's not spontaneous. It's because they've had hypertension since they were 27. So it's 20 years of uncontrolled hypertension. And then the dam breaks, you know, at that point. So it's not wait until they're 42 to start really addressing that, but really trying to figure out what we can do early on so that we can prolong any, any event that would happen. So, you know, this study just basically said, you know, given the the racial differences in hypertension before age 30, um, we need to really think about how we can find these people and, and, and diagnose the people that have it. The third, right at 33, that's, that's a lot and be able to try to make an impact, right? So when we think about hypertension treatment, and this is somewhat controversial, but not overly, um, you know, the standard approaches, and I just put there, you know, ACE and R, a calcium channel blocker, a diuretic, you know, and then pre on so forward on. That's the normal approach for the treatment of hypertension. But I teach the class at, 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 at hypertension at, at Neomed. And again, it's, it's been accepted that, uh, that a calcium channel blocker and hydrochlorothiazide or a chlorothalidone are always the best first choice for isolated hypertension treatment in African-Americans. And so I would see this uh, because if I had an overweight African-American with high blood pressure, I would put them on an ACE inhibitor because I figure if they ever got diabetes, I'd be protecting them and, and it'd be like a twofer or something. And they'd always come back and their blood pressure would still be high. And then I'd put them on a calcium channel blocker or a hydrochlorothiazide and would come down. And then little did I know, because I was too busy seeing patients to really look at the research, that they'd already been proven that this what this is the best practice. But it takes a while sort of for these um, recommendations to percolate through the community. And, and so, um, but, but it is a best practice in African Americans. It's what's being taught in the medical school. And our goal should really be, you know, less than 135 over 80. And, and we should try, you know, initially, unless there's kidney disease, unless they have diabetes, really not do an ACE or an ARB uh, or a beta blocker in the treatment of isolated hypertension and diabetes. As I tell people, I just, things change, right? And so I may tell you one thing this week, and a big study will come out next week, and it'll be different, and I'm not mad about it, because all I can tell you is best practice at the time, but and, but but know that this is, in my experience with a lot of African-American patients, this, is, this has helped a lot, right? Um, and then I've also seen this, that in, greater in, incidence of ACE-related cough in African-Americans, and then there's a significant, so it's almost a third of African Americans presented with an ACE will get an ACE cough. And that's significantly higher than the 15, 20% um, in, in, in the general population. And so I've now that the ARBs are, are um, generic and you can, they're affordable, I just almost skip a, an ACE and go directly to an ARB in order to avoid that. And also, um, there was an increased risk of, of ACE-related angioedema and hyperkalemia. And again, I've had multiple patients show up in the ER, my throat closed, I had my lips swole up, all behind, um, you know, lisinopril, 20 milligrams. And so I've, I've been trying to save myself trouble and, and save the patient because sometimes they'll just give up taking blood pressure medicine if they have an ER visit because of a blood pressure medicine or they have a cough they didn't associate with it. So I, I tend to try to skip an ACE unless I'm made, really made to use one because we, the ARBs kind of hold in there. And I, I reserve judgment, for, you know, the nephrologist can outrank me. So if they, they, they say something to you different, um, that's fine. But just knowing this, sort of the lay of the land in African Americans, particularly as it relates to this, um, you can consider that. Um, salt sensitivity, African Americans are disproportionately salt sensitive. And so I had a patient this morning um, I asked him, you know, his blood pressure was 180 over 108, you know, uh, my medical assistant's traumatized. He's feeling completely fine, no problem. And, and, and as we, I recheck his blood pressure and we talk about his medications and he was on medicine that he took this morning, um, I asked him if he used salt. 
And then in my head, I went 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and he still hadn't given me an answer. So I already knew what the answer was, right? A slow answer on salt means they use too much salt. And a, a quick answer, and you'll ask an elderly person, you use, oh, no, 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 no salt. They know, no, no salt, right? But the people who have the slow answer are big salt users. And that drives, that can really make it hard to control blood pressure. And then that salt sensitivity is not just salt users, but if you use salt and you have salt sensitivity, blood pressure is going to go up significantly. So, and this is what I told the patient this morning, that if you could just cut your salt in half, don't stop it. For someone who eats a lot of salt, and if you tell them to stop salt, um, they're, they're, it's not sustainable because their, their food is not, they're not, they're not going to be able to eat or enjoy any meals. And it's, it's a big process. So I tell them, just try to see if you can cut your salt in half, what you're using in half and use more onion powder, garlic powder, cayenne powder, curry powder, anything um, and, that has um, less salt. And so if you can do that, um, that has been shown to have a sustained reduction in, in blood pressure overall. Um, Switching to atrial fibrillation, and this is, again, surprising to me. I didn't know that African-Americans have a 40% lower risk of developing atrial fibrillation compared to whites. So there's a, lower, there's a lower risk of atrial fibrillation, but if they have atrial fibrillation, they have a much higher risk of stroke and sudden death associated with atrial fibrillation. So when you see an African-American with atrial fibrillation, you need to be aggressive about, you know, making sure they're anticoagulated. So you really want to make sure this is something that, that that's done and important. Now, when we're looking at, when we used to treat everyone with atrial fib with, uh, with warfarin, we would see the struggles associated with trying to, to achieve uh, therapeutic levels. And then African-Americans in general tend to require much higher levels of, of warfarin in the treatment of a DVT or a PE or, uh, or in atrial fibrillation. Thankfully, uh, we've got the newer anticoagulants and then we've seen there's no difference in the dosing um, the studies so far that I've seen it, that, that in terms of what you would use for some of the newer medications in terms of um, treating African-Americans between uh, for atrial fibrillation. So looking at uh, venous thromboembolism, it was curious to me to see that African-American patients have the highest first time venous thromboembolism risk, while uh, Hispanic Latinos have half the risk of whites. So again, we're thinking back about the life expectancy tables and where everyone falls, all these risks, these higher risks associated with lower mortality, lo sorry, lower life expectancy, and, these, and, the, and the lower risks associated with a higher life expectancy. Um, once an either an African-American or a Hispanic Latino has uh, uh, venous thromboembolism, we are at a higher rate for recurrence, much higher rate to have another one. So again, at every time someone says their leg is swollen, I, I get a, a DV uh, ultrasound on their legs because I know in that population, it tends to be a, a higher thing. It's more of a thing. Um, and then curiously, uh, Asian Pacific Islanders have that lower, a much lower risk of first time and cancer associated venous thromboembolism. So it's a, it's a, again, right in line with what we see. Now, if we look at um, cancer-associated thromboembolism, African-Americans, again, had the highest risk, and then Asian Pacific Islanders and Hispanic Latinos had the lowest risk. But I thought it was interesting to look at this, this slide in terms of percent risk is on the vertical axis, and the different cancers are across. And so um, Asian Pacific Islanders are the green bar, Hispanic Latinos red, blue, uh, it's not Hispanic whites, and then purple is whites. And so going from prostate cancer on the left side to pancreatic cancer on the right side, without exception, African-Americans have the highest risk of that thrombosis associated with it. And it's significantly high in pancreas and, and, and brain cancer and ovarian cancer. And then you can see those differences there. And again, Asian Pacific Islanders, you see them there, but always at the lowest risk. And so people have said, you know, what is, what is that? You know, what is that about? And so it's been thought, that African-Americans have a, a sort of a prothrombotic state that increases their risk for a DVT and PE. And some people say that might be related to um, increased von, Willi von Willebrand factor or, um, or factor eight. So looking at diabetes differences, now this is a, a neat study and I think you should be able to identify with it. They measured a number of people that were all did not have diabetes. No one has diabetes, right? And they measured their, they drew their blood, measured their A1C, they measured their fasting glucose, and they measured their two-hour postprandial. And so 
Stay with me because this can be a little complicated. So when you look at this graph here, um, African Americans are the black line to the far right, and non-Hispanic whites are that sort of S-shaped, um, what is that, brown line to the left. And then Hispanic Latinos are blue, and Asian Pacific Islanders are that orange in the center. And so these are all normal patients without diabetes. And so you see a range of normal for a hemoglobin A1C of what, 4.95, you know, and, and the, uh, the legend is messing that up, but just about to six. And so these are all people, this is how you end up with the bell curve of, of, of normal, right? What does that mean? So if you see that the um, African-American line is, is to the right, so they tend to have higher hemoglobin A1Cs compared to their matched glucose. If you look at the left side, the fasting glucose, the African-American uh, black line is to the left meaning that blood sugars tend to be a little bit lower. And you see, um, you know, the, um, the, the white line, the base is, is kind of buried in the center. And then Hispanic Latinos move theirs a little bit to the right. And then the 2R postprandial, the group kind of comes together. So what does that mean? It actually means that in terms of your hemoglobin A1C, African-Americans, a normal for their matched blood sugar is about 0.4 higher than the glucose matched white patients because of those, when you think about the differences between, between those, um, those groups. So in real life, this is one of my patients, a hemoglobin A1C of 6.3 in an African-American patient is really, really 5.9. And so even though it's flagged at 6.3, it's 5.9, their average blood glucose is not 134, it's 120 or 118 or whatever. And so in, some people would see the H and say, I need to intensify my therapy. Let's, let's raise the insulin if they're on insulin. Or, you know, let's, let's add another medication because we've got a big bar of H there. But in reality, with that fudge factor, you would, you would, you'd be a little more ginger about it. And then, um, I'm not a small print person, but if you look at the small print, which I normally don't, right? It says, you know, and this is affected by hemoglobinopathy, sickle cell, you know, um, hemolytic anemia, anemia, it, uh, just in general. And it's like a moment where you go, duh, yeah, hemoglobin A1C, hemoglobin, yeah. But for whatever reason, people like me, for example, just, just disconnected, right? And so um, it's like, I, oh yeah, it's the hemoglobin, right? And it makes sense. So, but there's data that, that actually shows that um, African-Americans with sickle cell trait will have a much lower hemoglobin A1C at any level. So you may see a six in a, in a person with sickle cell trait when it's actually eight. You know, well, they might need more intense study because either they're anemic or, or, or for the, just the general abnormalities just in having the trait. And so they say that the A1C is not, shouldn't be trusted in people with sickle cell trait and certainly shouldn't be trusted in people with sickle cell disease. And so we know in our practice who has sickle cell disease, but I'm here to secretly tell you, I don't know everyone that's in my practice who has sickle cell trait because I don't track that like I should. And so these are the people that we might, we might they're, they're telling us they're urinating all the time, they're going to the bathroom, they're doing all those things. We check a hemoglobin A1C to screen for, for diabetes and, and it comes back at six, and, and they're, but they're still wondering what's going on. And so, and then again, eight to 10% of African-Americans have sickle cell trait. And so that's, you know, you see 20 people in a day, you're going to see two people with sickle cell trait if you've seen 20 African-Americans. And so that's not insignificant. And so the reason um, we have to watch this 0.4, it's not that big, A1C 0.4, and it doesn't matter when their A1C is 12 or, or 11 or 10 or 9 even, it doesn't matter that 0.4, it doesn't matter because you're going to need to intensify your care, but when it gets towards normal, that's when you want to increase the intensity of, uh, you want to decrease your intensity of the care because who knew African Americans have consistently higher rates of severe hypoglycemia compared to whites, compared to Latinos and, and uh, Asian Americans. And so you've got to walk a little more gingerly as you get closer to normal. So 
I've outlined a significant number of problems, right? Weeded out a lot. I've got, I could have, I could certainly have gone on and on about the things that, but I, but I want to start looking at some exciting solutions. They're going to be right here under our noses. Um, we've gotten approval from our CEO, senior leadership team for the University Hospital Center for African American Health. And so I want to give just an overview about this exciting endeavor. As I've talked about already, Calgary County has a high rate, Cleveland has a high rate of, of just a high incidence of African Americans. They are here, they need care. The population has grown 23%. The median age is a young 34. And you know, talking about an unemployment rate of 10 means that the vast majority are employed. We don't have many of the issues with, with uh, unemployed, but, but we have insurance. And so we don't have many of the issues of people being unemployed that we had when I was younger in my career. So I've mentioned the differences in hypertension, the differences in diabetes now interpretation I just went over. There's a gene that puts African-Americans at higher risk for kidney failure that, that's in the Hall family. Um, and then there's that, that increased burden of peripheral vascular disease in, in African-American men and women. And infant mortality, which we haven't talked about, but it had been in great grand rounds in the past, um, African-Americans always consistently had the highest rate of, of infant mortality um, in Ohio. And But, but first year Cleveland with Director Kuhnen, from here at, at, um, at University Hospital, they were able to tick that on. They took an African-American centric approach to attacking um, uh, infant mortality and they were able to bring that down. And so that from as high as 16.3 in 2019 to 11. 7. So it's a significant and, and, and really first ever um, drop in infant mortality by addressing the needs of spe specific needs of African Americans. Um, there's been talk of, of different breast cancer screening recommendations for African Americans. Um, there's uh, certainly a higher rate of lung cancer with the lower smoking burden in African Americans. And so they, there's discussions about, you know, do you wait 25 pack years before you start doing it? Or is it, should, you, should it, would it be appropriate for that number to be different from African Americans? We've already talked about the five-year difference in screening for colon cancer, and now it's the same. And we haven't talked about, you know, prostate cancer in terms of African Americans having a disproportionately, African American men, disproportionately high rate of prostate cancer. And so we need to be start screening our African American men with a PSA really starting at 45, 40 or 45 annually. And so um, that's, that goes against the U.S. Preventive Task Force recommendation. But, but, but the urologists here at UH think that we're very safe to, to be able to recommend that as something that will change down the line. So you say, well, you know, you really, really need a center for African American health. Does that really make sense? Is that appropriate? Well, we'll see across the country. There's Asian Health Services that in Texas, Asian Heart and Vascular Center on, on both uh, both both uh, coasts, as well as the Spanish Latino centers in, in New Jersey and Florida, on, again, on the West Coast. And so here's what exists for African Americans, the Center for African American Health and um, in, 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 in the Center for Black Health and Equity. And then I added a minority men's health, which doesn't have African American in the name. But let's look at what they do. Um, basically, those top ones just do advocacy and community outreach. Um, there's no clinical care in Denver or North Carolina. There's no research, no network of providers, no tailored screening. Um, at Cleveland Clinic, and now that Dr. Modlin is at Metro, he's trying to reestablish it there. They will do advocacy and community outreach. They will commit, provide clinical care and do some research, but there'll be no network of providers. There'll be no tailored screening or treatment according to what we've talked about today already. And there'll be no quality uh, tra tracking. So this is gonna be something that's gonna be dramatic. And I, people have asked me, is, is, is there anything like this in the state of Ohio? There's nothing like this in the country. And so University Hospital is gonna stay on the national map by doing something that's dramatic. And really, if you're looking at the data, it's not that dramatic and really uh, making an impact that's gonna be copied all over. Uh, I just point this out as New York Center for the Study of Asian American Health. Um, this, uh, Sunny, Sunny at, at um, NYU has an NIH, um, Specialized Center of, of Excellence. It is a specialized center of excellence at, at, at New York University in Asian American health. And I, as I've shown you, Asian Americans, God bless them, 80, average life expectancy of 85.6. And so it, why couldn't a population that has a life expectancy that's over 10 years less 
have uh, NIH funded um, center of excellence. And so, and what if, since there are residency tracks in all, all these different locations in Hispanic Latino health and Asian American health, why not have a residency track in African American health in internal medicine here where, where we can spend some time learning about best practices and then go forth from University Hospital to Detroit and Los Angeles and Philadelphia and establish centers that, that and, and all, all, all the credit and it would be due the providers right here at, at University Hospital. So this new center of demographic need, as I, I've talked about, a societal need with broad funding opportunities, great opportunities, driven by research confirmed best practices only, similar than eth to other ethnic centers, but none providing comprehensive care for African Americans. So that's the Center for African American Health. I've left 14 minutes for um, questions. I know I always talk loud, fast. <laughs> Not necessarily loud, so I'm, I'm going to try to answer any questions if anyone has some. Hi, Dr. Hall. This is Keith Armitage. Thanks for that fantastic talk. And sure, we invite questions. You know, um, I've been here 36 years, and I learned in the last year or two from Selena that of all the major American cities, Cleveland has the highest percentage of African American population. So we're actually, you know, part of it is the demographics of Cuyahoga County, but we're actually the most the most diverse in the United States, and and your 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 center and and your presentation was just so critical for everything we do and our, our daily lives, taking care of patients. So, thank you very much. Um, and thank you. And uh, people can put questions in the chat or or turn on your camera. Keith, it's Dan. I have a question for uh, Greg. Uh, Greg, thanks so much for that talk. Um, I've been chatting with Gautam Rao, our chair of uh, family medicine, who, as you know, has been an expert on both um, obesity and other risk factors in, in adolescents and children, and has been working with the American Heart Association on that. And he relates to me a very interesting and somewhat surprising statistic that about 14% of adolescent uh, young men, boys, African-Americans are hypertensive. Mm. And that um, the biggest challenge in that age group is the present requirement, uh, as he says, for three office-based measurements of high blood pressure. And he's been working um, with a variety of tech solutions, both for um, either uh, obviously using ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, but even simpler solutions, you know, that that could be eventually um, you could imagine Apple Watch or even ring based solutions, because nailing down the diagnosis in an adolescent is not is going to be very difficult if you need three office visits. I guess the question is, understanding that 14 percent of adolescents are hypertensive really brings us down to a much lower age and just thought, you know, maybe have you thought about that and 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 what are your approaches to yeah, that? Th thanks. Um, you know, I, it's as, as an intern, as I started 18, but I know exactly what you're saying. It, 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 and we have young people with high blood pressure. And I found the real game changer has been these Omron um, um, uh, home blood pressure thing. I don't have to convince a person they have hypertension. I just tell them what the parameters are. You go home. When you're quiet after, you know, almost asleep at night, measure your blood pressure and see what it is. And then you tell me. And so um, um, because I you get I get great pushback to tell someone they have hypertension based on one visit because they always say I was excited. I didn't know it was coming. I, you're a new doctor. And all these things drive up their blood pressure. It usually doesn't drive them up 50 points, but but that's what they say anyway. And so they don't internalize it. So I, I and it's been I show them it's thirty two dollars. Bring up on the computer at, at Target, you know, you can afford $32. Go home and measure your blood pressure and see what it is. And they will call me almost, they can't wait until a month. They'll call me and say, you know, it, it really is high. And, and, it, and that brings it home. Also, again, for these younger people, they, I'd say it on Sunday morning, or we do it on Sunday morning in my house. I measure my blood pressure and I measure everyone's blood pressure in the kitchen. Everyone who's there, all my sons, all of them, and make sure everyone's blood pressure. So when you're measuring blood pressure, measure your teenage children's blood pressure so you can see what it is. So you, you know, so you can see what it is. So I think having the family know that, that this, just, this is what runs in our families, right? Um, it's not surprising to find hypertension. It, you know, 
certainly runs deep and hard in my family. And so all we have to do is kind of look for it and, and recognize it. So I think that's going to be a, it's going to be a cultural sort of change to say, you know, this, we're going to focus on health. We're going to start measuring our blood pressure at home. But it, but I found it, it, it saved me all kinds of energy trying to talk people into the fact that they have hypertension when they don't, you know, it's a silent killer. They don't feel anything. And so it's made, it's been a big deal changer, game changer for me. Awesome. Thanks. There's a, uh, there's a question in the chat from Dr. Kamon Leifert, representing the West Side, St. John's. Um, hey, Kamon. Um, thank you so much for your wonderful talk with this new initiative also focused on medical school and our residency education, as well as clinical care and research. Yes. Yes. I mean, that, that's going to be in integral. I mean, I think we need to, um, you know, educate um, everyone about these differences so that we can, we're all, we're all trying to do our best. You know, we're all trying to improve our patients. We're not trying to have them leave them, but a lot of times it's, it's a lot to know. It's a lot to remember, you know, who's at increased risk for this and that. And so I, you know, I use the family um, thing. When, when I was in medical school, we learned about Ashkenazi Jews having an increased risk for colon cancer and breast cancer. And, and, and I had a patient come in and the lady said she was an Ashkenazi Jew. And I was like, I've been waiting for you. You know, I mean, I, I know that I do a mammogram. I did a colonoscopy. They were both normal, but it just, it just triggered something that I had learned so many years ago. And so all I hope is that, you know, every African-American you see is not going to have hypertension or every African-American male is not going to have prostate cancer. But when you see it, think, ding, I need to check a PSA. I need to really check this blood pressure. If we see a younger person, I really need to really wonder if this is, this person's not increased risk. So I think when, the more we, we as a community, as a clinical community, educate medical students and, and, and the residents who all want to do, want to do right by our patients. I think that it'll all lift, it'll lift the rising tide will lift all the boats. Yeah, it's often, I think, you know, having this talk today, is hopefully part of our effort to educate residents and we'll record it, you know, it's recorded, we'll send it out to our residents who, who are not able to be here today because of their rotations. Um, there's another question in the chat. Um, is there any statistics from European countries in Australia with such huge racial ethnicity difference in clinical care of most medical problems? So. Well, you know, I'm in America, so I, I concentrate on African Americans, but you know, one of the data that strikes me and, and we talk and it strikes me and I don't know the answer, right? But um, African American men, have eight times the risk of prostate cancer compared to West African men, right? And so what is that? I haven't got the slightest idea, but it's not necessarily being of African origin that, that, is, that, that is the cause because now once a West African man moves to the United States and stays here a generation, guess what? His prostate cancer uh, risk goes up. So is it diet or whatever? But um, so it's not necessarily genetic certainly that gene that apol gene that causes um you know kidney problems and hypertension that's a genetic issue you know and there's other things that you know obviously a genetic issue and higher increased cholesterol which i see a lot of um but it's important to know that um you know that that these these differences occur some of it you know some people would say you know is some of it oppression is some of it you know just being oppressed does that drive up your blood pressure does that cause release of cortisol is that you know is poverty cause some of these things maybe but um but I, all i can do is treat the patient that's in front of me and so um in terms of knowing knowing what the causes are but i i know there are disparities whatever country you go to you're going to see significant disparities but um for now we're just trying to help see what we can do here in cleveland that's awesome, Dr. Hall. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat uh, or any more questions. I see Dr. Jackson Wright on the uh, on the Zoom. Dr. Jackson Wright invented hypertension. Um, and and I, is that um, Dr. Williams? Yes. Anybody, yeah, if anybody else wants to hop in. I, I wanted to uh, uh, pose a question, but first thank Dr. Hall for an excellent, uh, very informative review. Um, my question is really around something that after listening to your talk, I found myself wondering, and that is, you know, what is the data and how um, good or not good of a job are we doing with our efforts for screening and prevention? I mean, it strikes me that a lot of these 
um, uh, diseases with, with, you know, um, high mortality rates or, or lower survival or more um, serious or aggressive disease are things that are easily screened for and prevented, like colon cancer and breast cancer and lung cancer. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what the data says in terms of how good a job are we doing at screening for these very common, um, you know, uh, killers in our community? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Williams. Good to see you. Um, it's, it shows overall we're doing great. I mean, um, the, what happens is the, the levels of our life expectancy is going up, the screening is going up, everything's going up. But what we point to is that the disparity between African Americans in the bottom and Asian Pacific Islanders at the top is still staying there. And so they say the disparity is there, but we're all, the, the trajectory is up uh, in, term, the, uh, in terms of life expectancy for cancers. All of that, all of our treatments for cancers have improved dramatically. And certainly if you've been the doctor the last 20 years, you know mm -hmm. our survival for lung cancer is dramatically better than it used to be and our survival for colon cancer and breast cancer is all improving. But unfortunately, there's a, there's a difference between who's doing the best and who's doing the worst that's been difficult to, to break. As I mentioned earlier, um, African Americans were able to not have the worst outcomes in terms of lung cancer. And so that's not a bragging point. That's just a point that that, 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 that data point um, you know, has changed. But um, we're, we're, we're doing great, but we just can't, we can't let up. We can't take the foot off the gas. We've got to continue to try to be aggressive and try to leave no one behind, to try to not, not, not sort of be think, well, this person's never going to stop smoking, or this person's never going to do this or that. We need to, we need to have faith, because I've talked to those people, and in my head, thought that they were not going to smoke, and they come back, you know, six months later, and say, I stopped smoking, I finally did it. So you, you'll be surprised when you don't think you're having an effect, you're actually having an effect, but we're doing a great job. So this is a, not to beat on us as providers, it's just to let us know there's some nuanced things, some patient-centered things that we can do, not treat everyone the same. That's not the approach. You wanna treat the patient-centered approach to, to treating our patients. Thanks, Dr. Hall. Thank you. Dr. Wright um, did put a comment in the chat. Again, for the uh, younger students and residents, Dr. Jackson Wright is an emeritus professor who was a national leader in, in many clinical trials uh, of uh, regarding blood pressure. Uh, and uh, he said, you know, excellent talk, et cetera. He, his comment was the BP target recommended by the National Hypertension Guidelines is, uh, should, might be better 130 over 80. This metric is supported by evidence. So he, he recommends 130 over 80, particularly in... Um, African Americans. Yeah, and he said that well, the heat is measure is still 140 or 90, but as a clinician, he's, his target is 130 or 80. So, Right, absolutely. I agree. As much as you can be aggressive with it, that's perfect. Yep. Yeah, I was just going to yeah, I was just going to comment. Yeah, yeah the, the, the national guideline is for less than 130 over 80. And I mean, it's certainly supported by the uh, multiple clinical trials, particularly the sprint trial now. Which uh, actually treated to less than 120 over over 80. So, uh, but I think, and there was a, certainly a, a representative sample of blacks in the of these trials. And so that uh, I think uh, we can't stop at 135 anymore. Keep it going. Keep it going on uh, down to uh, clearly less than 130. Uh, systolic, and especially in Black populations who are at such significant high risk. Absolutely. Well, I yield to you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Jackson. Um, I think we're at the hour. Um, I want to thank Dr. Hall for a fantastic talk and 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 for your 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 initiative. It's so critical, and uh, uh, we want to have you back to hear more about it. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah.